Hello there. You're watching the press preview, a first look at what's on the front pages as they arrive. It's time to see what's making headlines with the PR consultant Alex Dean and the Guardian columnist Zoe Williams. They'll be with us from now until just before midnight. Thanks Good both. Evening. So let's see what's on some of those front pages. And we'll start with the Telegraph, which reports Scotland's first minister is being accused of a conflict of interest for giving aid to an agency in Gaza while his family was trapped there. The ICE headline, budget falls flat as Tories lose votes to reform. The Mail says uh, former defence secretaries have backed their campaign for a cash boost for the UK's armed forces. The Daily Express says that Queen Camilla will be in attendance at the Commonwealth Day service at Westminster Abbey on Monday. The Times speaks to the mothers of two students who were fatally stabbed in Nottingham and are accusing the police and the CPS of failing them. The Guardian runs an exclusive on private hospitals carrying out a tenth of all planned NHS operations. The Financial Times leads with central bankers in Europe and the United States sensing victory over the biggest inflation surge in a generation. A former Spice Girl voices support for Jerry following her husband, Christine Horner's recent issues. That's on the front of the mirror. And The Sun writes about a lottery winner who's kicked out her husband after he blew millions from their £148 million fortune. And for those who want to get rid of their beer bellies, the star says all you need to do is eat less calories for five days a month. <laughs> Excellent advice. And a reminder, by scanning the QR code you see on screen during the programme, you can check out the front pages of tomorrow's papers while you watch along with us. So tonight we're joined by Alex Dean and Zoe Williams. Welcome both. Thank you very much you. for giving up your Friday evenings to spend it with us. Let's get straight on and look at the tomorrow morning's newspapers. And we'll start with the Daily Telegraph, Alex. And uh, this is Hamza Youssef. Maybe in a bit of trouble well, over money given to an aid agency. He concedes that he overruled official advice in uh, directing £250,000 of taxpayers' money to go to UNRWA. Um, I may have a position that surprises you slightly on the principle of this. I think people who are elected should overrule people who are unelected more often. I think that's something that should happen because elected people are accountable to mm -hmm. us and if we disagree with their decisions, we can vote against them. And if people in Scotland think Hamza Yusuf did the wrong thing here, the opportunity is obvious for them at the next election to express that view. That said, so the, on the principle, I'm fine with him mm. um, determining where money uh, goes if that's um, the decision he's being asked uh, to take. The question is whether it was actually a good idea to give mm -hmm. money to UNRWA rather than, as uh, might have been an option, UNICEF more broadly, water organisations or other um, routes. And on that, because of uh, UNRWA's uh, alleged recent involvement with uh, uh, Hamas, uh, he might be on different ground. It's worth just going back before we, we get your yeah. opinion on this. Hamza Yusuf's family were trapped in Gaza for a, a weeks. It was, a, it was an absolutely horrible was time. Appealing. The wife's parents had gone back to visit other family members and they'd got trapped in the middle of the um, October the seventh mm -hmm. aftermath and it was so painful to watch i can remember him giving a press conference because it was just the whole the, the bombardments as they started were so close to him personally and he was so distressed um and i and i kind of feel like they're coming after him now for a donation to unra which everybody was making you know the british government gives it makes significant donations to unra and they stopped doing so when israel lodged their accusation that um that it was it, it was kind of full of Hamas operatives, but sacked, actually I think about twelve people as well. Well, well, but you know, Cameron said today or maybe yesterday even that he wanted to go back on that decision and for the UK government to to take up donations again to UNRWA. So they're clearly a really fundamental agency, mm -hmm. and um, I I think he may have made a decision in the in in a kind of in the rush of the moment, but I don't think he was doing it to protect his own family. Certainly not, and I. I don't think that it was a bad decision. No, I, I don't. Um, other people have alleged, and it's alleged in this story, so the allegation is made in this story that he was uh, acting under some kind of conflict of interest because of mm. his family situation. I don't make that allegation at all. The trouble for him, uh, as the Telegraph sets out, is the timing, because he makes the, he makes the decision to give the donation on November the 2nd, mm. and they're, in fact, the family's released on November the 3rd, and that's unattractive in the way that people see it. Yeah, the TikTok might not sound great to people. And, and this is a donation that's come from the Scottish Government. Well, that's important Correct. As well. Right. This is this it's is not his. Yeah, it's not his money. But he, it's he, also, he can do what he like with that. It's official amount of money that's come from the Scottish government. Correct. From this aid agency. Yeah, but you know, it, it, 
it's not. It's certainly not out with the bounds of possibility no. for all countries to be donating significant sure, amounts. Sure, but at this time, the rest of the UK government had suspended payments to that organisation. That's the point. Yeah, isn't but it? they think that was a mistake. Now yeah. Cameron thinks that was a mistake to suspend them. Yeah, but we, they, we, he had no right to know that at the time, did he? Yusuf didn't know that the UK government might reverse their position. No, but also, well, people did have different opinions on, yeah, on yeah, sure. at that point. At that point yeah. as well. And it, I mean, look, it's a story that's definitely going to have another shoe to drop. I think on it when we yeah, when we I, I agree. Across, yeah, across yeah. the next couple of days. All right, let's move on to the next story, still connected with uh, the situation in Gaza. Um, we'll, we'll talk about the reporting on the front of The Telegraph, I think, to start with. And this is about this opening of this maritime corridor, isn't it? I mean, from my recollection, this has been talked about since this war began, that they were going to try and bring aid in from Cyprus, and it seems as if they've finally got the... I mean, it, Cameron it does seem to have got really serious today and yesterday, because this is not... It did, calling on Israel to open the port and calling on the emergency port is only the third of three interventions. He also called for, I think, 200 trucks to be going in a day, mm -hmm. when at the moment there are only 50. Yeah. Um, and he also, of course, started to row back on the Armour decision. So I think he's looking... I think he's taking a serious look at what's on the ground, unlike, actually, the kind of... The mess overall messaging coming out of Sunak is just trailing the Americans, mm. whereas... I don't know, maybe maybe the Americans are kind of shifting their position and Cameron is trailing them too, but I get the impression that Cameron is actually has ha has actually had enough of, you know... Well, speaking with different voices, do you think, Alex? Well, when you, first of all, yes. And he's got a senior figure as his foreign secretary. Let your foreign secretary do his job isn't a bad idea. But secondly, I think, I think you and I might differ about the American position. Mm. I think it's quite clear, whatever your views of the Israel-Palestine situation, President Biden ran out of patience with... And the Biden administration ran out of patience with Israel's position some time ago. Mm. Uh, and so I don't think it's just, you know, um, it's very slowly following the American... I think the American position was set out some, some time ago. Well, yes and no. I mean, you're... You were getting very strong messaging coming out of um, American foreign affairs, but Biden could very easily have just picked up the phone to Netanyahu and said this is this is unacceptable. But instead of doing that, he was continuing to arm the Israelis even while he was hand wringing about the bombardments. The so he was I giving some very he, hasn't done that. he was know, giving some very you, mixed messages. If you were the American president, you made that call and it mm. didn't work. You wouldn't tell anyone, right? So yeah, that's, the, that's, that's that's the issue. issue. Lots of the rhetoric, lots of of. Please for the Israelis to act in a different way. We're full and entirely. No, but listen, if if, if the Americans, to... because basically an American, it wouldn't be a plea. It would be you have to stop doing this, or we stop arming you. Well, this is, and uh, they haven't stopped arming. This them. is the point, isn't it? It hasn't got to that point yet. But it does seem, from all uh, of the talk, as if that line yeah, is yeah, being yeah. set to for them to reach, and whether or not they reach that yet. We will find out soon, but this is this is in train. Um, let's move on to another story, and this is the budget. <laughs> it was the budget this week, if you can remember, a couple of days ago. Um, let's look at the front page of the I. <laughs> budget falls flat as Tories lose votes to reform. What do you make of this, Alan? Well, of course, um, Reform Party, I think, will be very unlikely to win a single seat at the next general election, but they don't have to win a single seat to do real harm to the Conservative mm -hmm. Party and its prospects, not just of forming government, but of, you know, being a surviving, plausible opposition in, the House, there, are you? in the House of Commons. And, and the speculation here um, in the aisle, though I haven't seen, we haven't seen the inside yet, the speculation is that the government had, to in a certain degree, hung its hopes on a successful budget in media reception terms and public reception terms, mm -hmm. and their polling suggests that's not uh, come about. Yeah, and, and so what did you make of, of the budget, uh, of this reporting? Do you think that what we heard in the budget could have been enough for the Tories I mean, to pull themselves out of the hole that they're in? A, no. B, what could have been enough? I mean, you just look at that budget and how insufficient it was. A lot of it is, is, is merely kind of signalling. So taking 2P off national insurance is kind of signalling that you're the kind of person who doesn't really like national insurance. And it's... it's it, I think I you're don't right. like national insurance. So. Well, that's great. Maybe you should stand and be destroyed in the general election. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm I would, joking. I would I'm make joking. the point that national insurance is basically to, another form of tax. I don't want you to be destroyed. No, I mean, I don't mind tax, so I don't mind it being another form of tax. But the point is... But it's a dishonest one. No, it doesn't right? matter. Just, no, we're not going to talk about the why because, we're Because the right thing now. is, all it, it's not going to make any difference to anybody's lives. It makes a small amount of difference around the 50 so, grand. No, no, no. If you're going to talk about the budget, you do need to talk about the why's and wherefores of tax. 
uh, at the lowest level, the, 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 the lowest incomes, at the level of destitution, there's almost no difference whatsoever, and a huge number of people are destitute. It will make a big difference I mean, it's absolutely to a lot of working people. Enormous. Though. Well, you know, anybody serious about living standards in this country is worried about the very large numbers of people who can't make ends meet, right? And, um, and that's what this budget this hasn't is, addressed this, at all. Yeah, okay, and, but the, the point was whether or not that cuts to tax was going to do anything for the electoral prospects. I think we I can think agree that probably. it probably is not going to. But where tax is used and can help is in defence spending, and this is the front of the mail, and they are desperate for defence spending to be increased as uh, many other people are. Do you want to take a guess at which former defence secretaries, and then when we find out, we can bet Yeah, it's frustrating other. not to know which ones they are. <laughs> but I think the, the, the campaign would have a good deal more force if it's bipartisan, if they are people from different political parties um, backing this call for uh, more defence spending. But, I look... It, on the one hand, if you get the kind of institutional capture of becoming the advocate for your department and that becomes a, a habit mm -hmm. in you, you know, and you fail to see the, the broader picture of government spending, people might criticise you. On the other hand, I really like the way that people become committed to their departments and advocate for mm. them, even after the time that they are in office. And from my, my own perspective, personally, I think it's unarguable that our, our armed forces are underfunded. But, I mean, Dannon was on the... Um, I can't... I'm only calling him Dannon, not because I'm disrespectful, but I can't remember how you're supposed to Lord address Richard previous... Uh, yeah, Lord Dannon. Lord, yeah. Lord Is Dannett, it...? Yeah. Surely he has a kind of Lord Admiral... No, I'm, I'm, special. I'm, no, he's not. So, you know, German uh, academics are, are doctor, doctor, or professor, professor. He's not like that. I mean, okay. He's just Lord Dunnett. Yeah. Okay. So, before, anyway, yeah. he was calling yesterday for three percent, and I did smell the distinctive whiff of a coordinated march with some people out here and some people in the middle. <laughs> so, I think you know. It, it, You'd hope they know how to organise well, themselves. Well, exactly, and I think they do know how to organise themselves. And so, I think. 2.5 is will be is the minimum they want, and but they're it, just going to go and go and go. That is will be an increase, of course, and and it's kind of undisputed that that needs to be done. That money needs to be found it, to increase the it would be armed, armed forces. It, it would be an increase, but it wouldn't be that big an increase because unlike most countries that are in NATO, we've always met our NATO mm -hmm. spending targets. So what so are we on now? Are we on two, two? Like two and a bit. Okay. Right. So two yeah, from two to two and a half. Okay. So it's an uplift. Yeah. If you're going to make a meaningful uplift, it probably does have to be three. Mm. Okay. Um, quick chat about the telegraph uh, and this is andrew bailey if we can uh why don't you tell us about oh this yeah, yeah, yeah inflation beating pay rise for banks he really doesn't andrew bailey really doesn't have mark carney's kind of <laughs> easy Political. charm he just like mark carney seemed to never get into trouble however difficult the thing he was saying was and andrew pa bailey seems to get in trouble with literally everything so it was about six months ago, or maybe even more, that he blamed the cost of living crisis on low-paid wages, low-paid workers asking for too much money. Don't ask for money, well, he said. Um, he didn't say low-paid wages. He asked the country to, to, to no not wages. seek. He asked us to exercise pay restraint. Yeah. But that was ex but given his uh, pay. I mean, given his pay, it made everybody choke on their the whatever point of, they were eating. The point of the story is Just that so. at the same time they were planning to give pay rises to the staff of the Bank of England. Right. Right. That's the trial. That's, <laughs> <sticks laughs> that's, that's the issue. Although no, this is. This is today's news, right? No, but, they, but you don't, but give, a sal you don't like... give a salary rise on the day, right? It's right, right there's a run-up okay. to it. Okay. And in the, he must have known that, yeah, they, was yeah, gonna, yeah, that yeah. they were going to give their staff salary rises. You don't determine it overnight. The thing is, I mean, it is, to be fair to him, 4% isn't a huge, isn't no, sure, a huge sure. amount. It used to be quite normal to get that kind of pay rise on an annual basis. Right, Alex, Zoe, thanks both. Plenty more to come from you two after the break, where we'll be uh, looking at some of the other stories making the papers tomorrow, including this one on the front of the mail, highlighting Meghan Markle's claim that the worst kind of online abuse is women attacking other women. Stay with us. Hello there and welcome back. You're watching the Press Preview. With me, the PR consultant Alex Dean and the Guardian columnist Zoe Williams. We're going to take a look through some of the uh, morning's newspapers again. But just before we went to break, we were talking about that story on the front of the Telegraph about Hamza Youssef having donated £250,000 to uh, an aid agency in Gaza. Well, the Scottish government have responded to that Telegraph story, saying that UNRWA had no role in the situation regarding the First Minister's extended family, and any suggestion of a conflict of interest in this matter would be completely untrue, 
and simply a regurgitation of ludicrous far-right conspiracy theories to be found online. The Scottish Government coming out strongly, uh, refuting that story on the front of the Telegraph. I think that story has got more to run. All right, let's carry on, guys, and we're going to look, I think, now at some of the stories concerning the royal family. Let's start with the Express, if we can. Uh, and this is Queen Hilda. Yeah. To the rescue, the Express tells us. I mean, so it's not been an easy time for the royal family, to state the obvious. The king, deeply unwell, uh, Kate in and out of hospital. Um, uh, of course, not too long ago, the passing of both the Duke of Edinburgh and the, the, the late queen. And um, the, uh, our new queen is uh, taking up more significant duties. And the sense, as reported in the Express, is that she's taken to it like a duck to water. Mm. She's just carrying on. I mean, I think the, uh, probably the most puzzling and problematic thing for them is that all anybody wants to know is what they don't know. Mm. So, you know, nobody... There was the whole business where uh, an engagement was released for Kate Middleton and then it was oh, yes. removed from the website and people still don't know when she's going to start making public appearances well, again. It was um, announced that she was never coming back until after Easter. So yeah. yeah, but that was, was June. That was June the, the 8th, palace, and then the it palace was taken was clear, down. And then what I think happened was the organisation, because it was a branch of the military, had, just, you know, had, mm. had that in the pipeline yeah, for a yeah, while, yeah, and yeah, they, yeah. they put the wrong thing on. People are so keen to find news about the royals now that they'll spin something out of nothing. We were cut, is, The last is, time we were on the, sh on the show talking about it... What were we people, talking about? I was talking about, about Kate. <laughs> uh, going <in> now, <laughs> and, and afterwards, people were like, pouring over our, our remarks yeah, online, saying, this might have meant this or that. Guys, I really don't know anything yeah, yeah, about yeah, Kate. Yeah, 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 text yeah. from family asking me for the uh, gossip. That's exactly right. Friends of mine asked me, and I'm like, how am I supposed to know? I don't know. All right. Let's uh, look at the front of the Daily Mail, and I okay. don't know if there's a, an, an irony in this, that they're talking about Meghan Markle and the abuse that she suffered online, the Is Daily it... Mail, who wrote many stories that were attacking I mean, Meghan Markle. basically, I do really feel for Meghan Markle, because we're in their Netflix documentary, when they just laid out the kind of abuse she got mm. online, on, on the socials, following a negative story, which was very often in the Daily Mail, and it was very often obvious racist dog whistling. Um, you did kind of look at it and think, that is outrageous, yeah, you know? Cool. It's like, it doesn't even matter if they weren't doing it on purpose. They should have... She, she should have been able to tell them that was happening and for them to stop, and they yeah. never stopped. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the story in this is that she gave the story in for in the, this speech for International Women's Day and says the most abuse she got was when she was either pregnant or she had a newborn. And I do think that's bad. I, I agree with you. I do think people should be nice to you when you're pregnant. Obviously bad, and, <laughs> and it shouldn't happen. I disapprove of it because I disapprove of anyone being abused. I disagree with her about the worst um, attacks online uh, on women being from other women. I think the worst attacks on women online are from misogynistic men. And the trouble is that she... Uh, if she I don't deny her experience, but mm. extrapolating from one person's yeah. experience to the, to the general, I think, is very often a mistake. And I think it's a mistake in this example. And secondly, so we agree on that. Where mm. we disagree is, I think, not no one should be abused. Is the dichotomy uh, mm. of the um, ha Harry and Meghan uh, desire for privacy so stated, so strongly stated? I must insist on privacy. I must have privacy. I'm going to discuss privacy in my next 16 part <laughs> documentary on Netflix discussing my private life. And I mean, Spotify podcasts, don't forget the But Spotify listen, podcast. I don't, I don't I'm, I'm think, sorry, I I think the that, latest plug. I yeah. think the need for privacy was born out of the, her being relentlessly attacked. I think if the press had been really nice to her, the, she wouldn't have needed the two so things much privacy. At the same time, can they have wanted to have privacy because of that? But also realise that there's something to earn money and they wanted the documentaries in the podcast well, series but, it, but it's also a question of fairness and having your own corner, right? It's like the press yeah. always has the last word, unless you have the last the, word, that's... and then the press accuses you of talking too much. That's true, but the trouble is there's a, dif there's a difference, obviously, between abuse and reasonable questions and reasonable criticism. Yeah. And once you get so used to saying, this is just abuse, so I don't have to put up with this, I'm not going to listen to it, you start dismissing what are realistic or reasonable but questions. Are you supportive of the fan? But yeah. a lot of the, a lot of the questions weren't that reasonable. You know, it's like she was completely... She was ruthlessly attacked for eating avocados yes. when Kate Middleton was allowed to eat as many avocados as she liked. It's completely <laughs> abhorrent. It, it, it's, there's something else about this as well. It's, yeah, the, yeah. it's about the online abuses. I mean, this is the thing. It's just... It's so easy... You were talking about it in the break, about your mentions. Yeah. It's so easy for people to attack one another online. And, it, and I don't quite know how you end up reversing that kind of horrible hole that we've fallen down as a society. It's been a cliche for a long time that people wouldn't be as rude to you in person as 
they are mm. online. My worry now is that that's not the case anymore. It's over. And people are becoming more yeah. and more rude. They, they want to go up and scream abuse at a politician in a way that you wouldn't uh, have in the past. Uh, and they want to go and vandalise something so that you have to put it behind glass and behind steel and behind concrete bollards and so forth. And in the end, what we've got is a worse society. Yeah. What you're doing when you scream that abuse doesn't change the person's mind. Slashing up a painting in Cambridge doesn't change Israel's policy in Gaza. It just makes you unable to visit the room anymore that the painting was in, or at least to approach the painting closely. And that's the I mean, outcome. I don't, I mean, I don't really agree. See, you're looking at it all the way, all the time, as though the kind of dishevelment in standards of courtesy online have infected real life standards, and that's why we're angry with politicians and we're slashing up paintings. But I would put to you that the standard of behaviour from politicians has taken a precipitous dip. And the standard, and the reason somebody slashed up mm -hmm. a photo of a, a painting of Balfour is very, very obvious. OK, I can't let you come in, unfortunately, <laughs> but so we have final word. But look, you're going to stick around, right? You'll get, yeah. you'll get a chance to say something. <laughs>